Alright, buenos dias, mis amigos. Alright, today I'm going to pick on this guy right here. Uh, I don't know what his name is, but uh, it doesn't really matter. He's not really teaching his own teaching or anything from the Bible. He's teaching from a script. And I'm going to show you how crazy this is and this is what 99.9% .9 of all the preachers that stand behind a pulpit in front of a congregation teach in the world today and it's pure insanity and I just want to help people to see how ridiculous this stuff is now you and I that are born of God and believe the Bible we have an advantage over these people that do not believe the Bible and are not born of God so let's use that advantage let's take um, let's uh, hold you know hold that and uh, cherish that fact and understand that fact and know that fact that we do have the advantage over them that are blind okay now first of all before I get started let me show you something that is just weird well it's weird but it's it makes sense it, it when you understand that we are living in a world full of deceivers all right just as the Bible said what happened in 2nd Timothy chapter 3 verse 13 evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived and the evil man right here and a seducer is deceiving and being deceived these guys do not care about the truth at all they don't even care about common sense and simple logic and they'll go so far as to without directly saying it they'll indirectly say the Bible is lying and that Jesus Christ is not God and the things that they imply is extremely evil now here if you if you did a, a search for this to me is weird you got 15 verses in Revelation 20 and why would you break it up into parts you know whether it's uh, Revelation 20 verses 1 through 6 1 through 10 you know uh, 11 through 15 or 7 through 15 why would you it takes what three minutes to read that chapter it just it's weird to break it up like that in my opinion but look Calvary Chapel Johnson Cornerstone Chapel Leesburg Virginia Revival Christian Fellowship how is it that all these guys are teaching the same thing well they're teaching from a script every single one of them look at him skip even skip does uh, I don't know yeah even uh, uh, Murray what pastor Murray is that his name that old fart and this guy here and these guys here Calvary Chapel Ontario Canada so this is all these are all different churches look at them this is insane man Bruce Gore even Bruce Gore does whoever that is 
I, this, I mean, it's pure insanity, man. This is an old script. I know they downloaded it from the internet. They don't teach from the Holy Spirit. They teach a script that they downloaded from the internet. I just want people to see that. It's, and to me, have you ever seen the movie They Live? And look at this. This is just, that was one day ago, five days ago, 12 days ago, two weeks ago. <laughs> How is this possible? It's, in, it's insane. Have you ever seen the movie They Live? You know, there's that scene where these guys they put up the the glasses on and then then and then they can see they can see the ugliness how ugly these guys are they're not of us and so that's what I want to do uh, to help you put on these glasses to see how dirty and ugly these people are and I'm telling you, it's not, it's not just a mistake, man. It's not like they just got a little bit of dirt on their face and you just wipe it off and everything's okay. These guys are ugly, disgusting to their core. And what they teach is pure filthiness. And it's absolute lunacy. And they reject the power of God and so let me walk you through this oh perfect great okay so yeah you know we just have a couple of chapters left here uh, been an incredible time to study the book of Revelation especially in the days that we live today uh, as we watch the world around us really uh, vaulting itself towards uh, the end times hopefully you can hear that it's a, this is as loud as it gets well, I could make it louder, I guess. And you and I believe that our redemption is drawing near. Uh, that the time for the return of Jesus for his church is coming quickly. So if you remember a few chapters ago, back in chapter 14, we were told that the harvest of the earth was ripe. And we said that that meant that the time had come in God's sovereign plan to move things towards their conclusion. All right, so the, the, I don't. I wasn't gonna pick on that. See, uh, over here I got some. I was gonna, you know, there's one point I want to make, and then there's another point that I want to make, and then there's a third point that I want to make. But I'm just gonna walk through this. This was not one of them. But let's just real quick. Let's not let this guy get away with anything. All right, so in Revelation 14. Here, I better open this up. Talks about the harvest. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. Uh, on the cloud. Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth, earth is ripe. Alright. So... He that sat on the cloud thrust his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now, this harvest happens at the end of the world. And this is no different than what we're reading here in Matthew 13 when Jesus describes the harvest he says let both grow together until the harvest and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn alright now the harvest is the end of the world according to the Word of God 
not according to this deceiver according to this deceiver it is just one phase of the end of the world it's not the end of the world and that is exactly what we've seen over the last several weeks when we came to chapter 16 we saw the final bowls of God's wrath that were poured out on the earth okay so again can't let him get away with anything here the vials of the wrath of God all right so in Revelation uh, 16 but here in, in verse uh, in Revelation 15 excuse me it talks it says and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever and then in Revelation 16 we get descriptions of these vials being poured out these vials that are being poured out as the wrath of God now what this liar and deceiver what he'll say is that it really didn't do anything it really it had no effect at all it absolutely didn't do anything of any significance whatsoever God poured out his wrath but the unsaved and Satan and the devil everybody survives and really you just might as well come out and say God is impotent uh, God is uh, weak I mean really he's gonna say it. he's not gonna say it directly but you get when you hear him s admit that God is gonna pour his wrath upon the whole world and then turn around and say that the, the unsaved are still going to live that's the same thing as saying God is weak it's the same thing whether you want to be honest about it and just directly say it or not that's what you're implying when you say that the wrath of God had no effect on the world. Then in chapters 17 and 18, we saw that God was dealing with the end time system, that one world government that will come to be. Right there, that one world government that will come to be. To me, this is pure insanity. All right, so in Daniel... Daniel talks about four kingdoms until the end of the world and that he doesn't he doesn't name the fourth kingdom the last kingdom but we know the last kingdom is here because the third kingdom that Daniel mentions is long done away with right that, that is long ago it ended and that was the Greek Empire so we're no longer in that third kingdom so now we're in the fourth kingdom which is the Roman Empire there shouldn't be any doubt about it now this guy says the one world government that is to come I, I mean you, you have to ignore what the Bible says to make that claim in Luke chapter 2 verse 1 it says and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed now of course you if you don't believe the Bible you're not gonna believe that there's there was a one there's always been a one world government system in play even when Jesus was walking on the earth there was a one world government and it was in the 90s when George Bush said a new world order implying that there was an old world order it's not I, what in the world are these guys teaching really there everything's just jolly there's no antichrist there's no one world government I mean this is delusional uh, and then when we came to chapter 19 we saw the Lord Jesus return to earth along with the armies of heaven <clears throat> 
we saw the false prophet and the Antichrist captured and thrown into the lake of fire. We saw the armies of the earth gathered against the Lamb, and remember they quickly lost that battle. No, no. Okay, all right, so he says they lost that battle. What he doesn't say is that they didn't lose the war because they still live after. He's not shooting straight with you guys. He's not a straight shooter. Uh, in fact, it wasn't much of a battle at all, was it? <laughs> Except the unsaved survived. <laughs> uh, it was quick and it was definitive. We then saw the birds of the air come and they had a great feast on the bottom. This, this doesn't even begin to make sense, man. How did the unsaved live? How did they survive all this? He doesn't say. And I, I bring this up because you're going to hear him talk about the unsaved after Jesus returns. He's even going to say that they are more than the sand of the sea. There's going to be a lot of them. There's only one conclusion that you can draw. And that is the enemies of God are those who are saved at the end of the world. In other words, you and I that are born of God, we are the enemies of God. He won't directly say it, but he indirectly says that God is going to destroy all of us that are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen. Bodies of those who had lost, who had died. Then we saw a significant event as an angel came from heaven took the dragon and bound him with a chain and cast him into the bottomless pit uh. <laughs> that he might dis not deceive the nations for a time sadly though in chapter 20 verse 3 we see that Satan will one day be released sadly all this that God has done was for nothing sadly once again after the capture of the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the dragon, we see that Jesus will set up a kingdom on earth, and this kingdom will last for a literal 1,000 year period. <clears throat> yeah, okay, so that's not in the Bible anywhere. He just jumped outside of the Bible, and he's getting that from a movie that he watched on Netflix the other night, because it's not in the Bible. I can't show you that it's not in the Bible because it's not in the Bible you understand that right I can't say hey look it's not there I can't show you something that's not there right I can't but it's it's not here anywhere you're not gonna read anywhere in Revelation 20 about this idea of Jesus Christ setting up a thousand year kingdom it's nowhere to be found and it's contrary to everything that we've read in the Bible. Right? Because we are putting our faith and our hope and our trust in a world of everlasting life. A kingdom of everlasting life. Life that never ends. Not a thousand years. What's this thousand years that he's preaching? Well, he's preaching a thousand years of dirty sex these guys are mockers these guys are scoffers of the Bible walking after their own dirty lust I'm gonna show you period and last week we took a look at those scriptures and we talked about some things that would be happening during this time it will be a time of great joy and peace humanity and dirty sex it's really that's what it's all about 1,000 years of dirty sex where he thinks 
he's going to have the ability to rule over people and demand that they perform sex, sexual dirty sex on him. Humanity, remember, will suddenly be... He won't admit it, but that's the only conclusion that you can draw. Listen. ...in to live much longer... The animals, we said, will behave differently. Remember, the lion and the lamb will be seen laying down together. And we said that you and I, who are believers, would rule and reign with Jesus during this time. Did you hear that? You and I will rule. You cannot take that lightly. He's claiming that he's going to rule in this thousand-year period. Now who's he gonna rule over? Huh? I mean, just be honest. Who's he gonna rule over? Well, what he won't say is that he's gonna rule over women and children. And men, I guess. I mean, you never know, right? These perverts today, you never know. But listen to them. Fine. This week, as we continue, uh, we need to keep in mind that the word says clearly that Satan will be released from the bottomless pit one last time. Uh, and that is exactly what we see as we pick up the narrative in verses 7 and 8 of chapter 20. Verses 7 and 8, it says, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sea, uh, the sand of the sea. There it is. So we're told here that the 1,000 year reign of Jesus, uh, that the expiration time comes, and Jesus reigns, and then it's over. Yeah, think about that. Just that statement alone is evil. <laughs> Jesus, I mean, you got to completely be willingly ignorant of the scripture. It's you're not even preaching the Bible at this point. You're preaching a Hollywood movie that you watched on Netflix the other night. It's it's unfathomable that anybody can stand behind a pulpit and pretend to be a man of God and to pretend to be teaching from the Bible when what they teach is not from the Bible at all. In Luke chapter 1, verse 33, talking about Jesus, He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Hey, not a thousand years, man. What in the world are you thinking? There's not, it's not going to come to an end. As this guy, this liar and deceiver, had just told us. into your reign of Jesus, uh, that the expiration time comes, and we wonder... Thousand year reign of Jesus, the expiration comes. Just, it's so casual. Just so calm and cool. And so casual, nobody will notice. Nope, it seems like nobody notices, huh? Uh, if you go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. In Revelation 20, and he laid hold on that old dragon, on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. But the, this is all the same. And the serpent is more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And you just look, you just saw an example of how subtle the serpent is right here. Reign of Jesus, uh, that the expiration time comes, and we wonder what the people of Earth will be thinking during that time. Will they be counting down the days? Will they know that these very scriptures will come to pass shortly? Will they be counting down the days? What days? The days till what? 
No man knows the day or the hour when the Lord comes. Right? So what he wants to say, well, the Lord already has come. And nothing happened. And God poured out vials of wrath upon the earth and nothing happened. It, that just couldn't destroy the unsaved. Nothing. All things continue as they were. Shortly, as they see Jesus reigning for a thousand years, some people might have great dread at the thought that Satan would be released. And well, that's an interesting idea right there. Some people might have great dread that Satan might be loosed. Some people might have great dread of the idea of Satan being loosed. Now, I could show you a verse about that says, uh, you know, fear not him that can kill the body but not the soul right but rather fear him that is God which is able to destroy both soul and body and hell but if we go to Matthew 24 and we can go to Mark 13 and Luke 21 and read the same thing but when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven all of the tribes of the earth mourn all not some, all. All that are not saved. See, those of us that are saved, we're up in the air. All, all the tribes of the earth are going to mourn. All. All the tribes. Revelation 1. <laughs> Revelation 1. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Every eye. Every eye. And they also which pierced him in all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Well, they'll mourn. It'll be a great time of terror. I mean, people will be shocked. They'll be devastated because... They know it's the end of the world. They won't be afraid of Satan. They're going to be afraid of God. Men's hearts failing them for fear. Men's hearts failing them for fear. That means they're going to be having heart attacks because of how afraid they are because they know this is it. It's the end of the world. It's judgment day. It's the great day of the Lord when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven when he comes with power and great glory at the end of the world what is this guy teaching and others as we'll see may have a heart that says finally we can rebel we can do as we please. We'll have a Wait a second. Now, I, I, I spoke a little bit long there, but think about the context that he's speaking. He's talking about a time period when Jesus reigns on the earth and there is no uh, need. He Well, I'll have to list, I'll let him speak. I'll let him speak. You'll see. Some people might have great dread at the thought that Satan would be released, and others, 
as we'll see, may have a heart that says, finally, we can rebel. We can do as we please once again, for we know that Jesus will have a uh, will reign with a with an iron scepter. Uh, what he says will go. Uh, people on the outside will be obedient, but on the inside, you'll see as this develops that many people's hearts are not right with God. Uh, many people's hearts are not right with God. I can't let him get away with anything. <laughs> ah. Let's see. See, when Jesus comes, it's the end. Right? And when he comes and it's the end, then we are changed from corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to, to immortality. Uh, even in the thousand year reign. Again, this is the bottomless pit uh, that Satan has been bound in, and we might be reminded that even though he was bound for a thousand years, when he is released, there is no change at all in Satan. He is the same old deceiver, and that's what he does. He goes out to deceive the nations once again. Alright, so... You, you heard what he said about um, people's hearts wanting to rebel against God. And then Satan is loosed and then they can so they can finally rebel against God. All right. So in other words, they don't have a pure heart when Jesus is reigning after his return. This is the bottomless pit uh, that Satan has been bound in and we might be reminded... Now, I might remind you also that what he's really referring to is um, the people of God. He's saying that they don't have a pure heart. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I could get into this. When do we get a new heart? That would be a good question, right? Ezekiel 36, a new heart will I, also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you? Oh, um, well, just to, I guess, uh, I will take away the stony heart of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. So, um, I guess, uh, That's uh, see. I, this is not gonna work. Um, basically, uh, right now we have the Spirit of God, and um, this old temple is gonna be destroyed, and a new temple has already been rebuilt. Jesus has done that, and so when He returns, we will have a new temple, and. Um, the Spirit of God that is in us is evidence of that. Um, well, what this fellow is saying is that <laughs> Jesus is going to return. We're going to be the same, I guess. Right? Reminded that the same as in the sense that we are now. And he wants to make a. Uh, point that we're going to be living longer, but we're still going to be in this corruptible flesh. Even though he was bound for a thousand years, when he is released, there is no change at all in Satan. He is the same old deceiver, and that's what he does. He goes out to deceive the nations once again. Uh, we also notice here that it is. I gotta say this that Satan is not a being. It is a spirit that is absent of God, and it's clear all throughout the Bible. He's treating Satan as though he's a person or a being, maybe a UFO alien. I, it's hard to tell, but it his 
idea of Satan is is bizarre. And it is not like Satan suddenly breaks out of jail here, or that he somehow escaped his prison. The reality is that he is released, and that means very simply that God has another purpose for him, that God is not done using him. And we should keep in mind that God has a purpose for allowing Satan to do the things that he is permitted to do. Uh, that is always something we should keep in mind, that as the enemy works, God has a purpose in it. Uh, always, always keep Satan in mind. Is that what he's saying? We also see in here, there's a mention uh, that says that they go, that he goes out to the four corners of the earth and once again gathers them for battle. And we see two places mentioned. Do you guys see Gog and Magog in there? I see uh, you. You might be familiar with those two names. I, I might be familiar with that. They're found in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, this is not the same battle that is mentioned in... Hey, hey, hey it's a, this might be the only thing that he's gotten right so far. Ezekiel. Uh, so this is a different conflict that comes about. Uh, the speaking of these two specific sites may just be a reference to, hey, the rebellious of this world that will one day gather once more. And we see here that the nations, uh, even though they've experienced a thousand years of joy under the reign of Jesus Christ, that they will be deceived once again. Thousand years of joy. Keep that in mind. A thousand years of joy. What's he mean? Well, what's he? What he really means is a thousand years of dirty sex. They are gathered together, and notice it says that they are as numerous as the sand of the sea. So it's not just a few people. Oh, what's he talking about? You. I don't want you to get distracted by my dirty sex comments here. The scenario that he's painted is Jesus has come and there are unsaved people as numerous as the sand of the sea. a reference to, hey, the rebellious of this world that will one day gather once more. And we see here that the nations, uh, even though they've experienced a thousand years of joy under the... The nations must all be unsaved. ...reign of Jesus Christ, that they will be deceived once again. They are gathered together, and notice it says that they are as numerous as the sand of the sea. So it's not just a few people that are rebelling against Jesus at this time. There are so many people that you can't, cannot number them. Uh, and I Think about that. The scenario that he's painted, there are so many people that you really you can't even count them here we've had a thousand years of peace according to him and yet there are so many unsaved people you can't even count them why would they be unsaved they've had Jesus among them and there's been nothing but good going on in the world for a thousand years and I see some of your faces that you're saying how on earth how on earth is this a possible scenario how on earth are you teaching this stuff He can see it in their faces. Like, what are you teaching? This is, remember, this is after Jesus comes, after we are transformed into our glorified bodies. 
when we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump we are we have put on this immortal body and we have everlasting life and he's saying talking about some thousand year period where there's so many unsaved people you can't even count them as the number of the sand of the sea and then he looks up and people are like what in the H-E double hockey sticks are you talking about well that's alright he's got a script he's got the script he'll read from the script and just ignore logic and common sense and just keep on going us at this time there are so many people that you can't cannot number them uh, and I see some of your faces that you're saying how on earth will that be we might even say well where did all these people come from how do we have even this many people in the earth at this time uh, at the end of the bowl judgments of, of Revelation 16 and after the battle of Armageddon and by his own words the wrath of God the judgment of God and the destruction of the world and yet there's still so many people you can't even number in chapter 19 you get the idea that the population of earth is almost entirely wiped out well during the millennial reign as people begin to live much longer uh, than they have since the flood of Noah the population will see a massive explosion. Alright, so there's nothing at all in the Bible to suggest that people are going to be living like they did in the days of Noah before the flood. Nothing at all. He's just completely making that up. Alright. I know he he's gonna want to reference Isaiah but that's not what Isaiah says at all so he'll just talk, I think he says something about a hundred years dying accursed which is interesting the world will be repopulated because if you die accursed you're not saved once again and at this point of the millennium you've got a thousand years of people reproducing and so the amount of people on the face of earth will grow rapidly reproduction will occur yeah, that, wow. that the population of earth is almost entirely wiped out well during the millennial reign as people begin to live much longer uh, than they have since the flood of Noah the population will see a massive explosion the world will be repopulated once again Repopulated is code for dirty sex. You know that, right? Be repopulated. So it's going to be like you're 19 years old or 30 years old or whatever. I think the gentleman the other day when I played a video, he talked about being 30 years old and being in great shape and being able to have wild sex all the time. Right? And so this is what he's preaching also. There's going to be wild, dirty sex for a thousand years. And you're going to be in your, and you're going to be fit. Fit as a fiddle. It's going to be wonderful. And you're going to have rule. I'm going to be ruling over you. And so if I say, let's have sex, baby, then that's it. You're the boss, right? I mean, that that's what he's teaching. It's going to be an explosion of people because he's going to be having all kinds of sex well during the millennial reign as people begin to live much longer uh, than they have since the flood of Noah the population will see a massive explosion the world will be repopulated once again and at this point of the millennium you've got a thousand years of people reproducing and Dirty so the sex. amount of people on the face of earth will grow rapidly. Uh, remember it said that if someone dies at a hundred years of age, it, it says that they would be as if they were accursed. Uh, 
I can't. What are you talking about, dummy? I know what he's talking about. I know what he's talking about. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that has not filled his days, for the child shall die in a hundred years, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. Now, this is not talking about, uh, you know, a, th a thousand bonus years or whatever. Right. So I don't, you know, I can't even begin to imagine how mind-numbingly stupid you got to be in order to believe this is referring to a time period after Jesus returns and then before a new heaven and a new earth. I mean, I can't even begin. I mean, you have to be willingly ignorant of all the scripture to teach that sort of stuff. It's just so stupid. There shall be no more thence an infinite days, nor an old man that has not filled his days, for the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. Now, if this helps you, the child, being a child of God, you I see, this is a whole nother sermon, but you think about when Jesus says, <clears throat> excuse me, unless you come to me as a child, you can in no wise see the kingdom of God. If I could remember exactly the phrasing of that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I know it's here somewhere. I feel like I'm sidestepping a little bit. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. See, this is not about having dirty sex for a thousand years. It's something totally different. Okay, so right now, those of us that are born of God, we, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a hundred. I'm getting pretty close. But if I was a hundred, I'd still be a child. And this is what Jesus is referring to. Except you become converted, except you be converted and become as little children. So even though I'm, you know, working my way to being a hundred years old, I'm still a child. Because I've been converted. And Really what he's teaching here is just the, the mindset, the, men, the mentality of a child. Because children are always full of joy and eager to learn and obedient. And uh, this is why everybody loves children. Because they got such a great outlook on life. And that's essentially what Jesus is saying. is Be as, be as little children. Children of God. Right? Now, on the, conversely, the, the sinner... Right, because this is contrary to the child. Right, the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. Uh, this is the difference between the saved and the unsaved. Right, those that believe in Jesus and those who do not. Uh, this this is not has nothing at all to do with uh, thousand years of dirty sex and living much longer th and living in the as long as they did in the days of Noah. That I, there's no way that I could show you. Hey, that's not what it's talking about because it's not what it's talking about. It's not implied there anywhere at all. This is pure imagination. 
in order to justify his teaching of a thousand years of dirty, stinky sex. Uh, so there will just then just in case reproducing, and so the amount of point of the millennia. Yeah, well, what he's really saying is he's going to be just reproducing like mad in this thousand years, right? That's all he's talking about, and that's all this is about. And this is the only point that he's making for this whole entire sermon. He wants to tell people that he's going to be on the rampage. He's going to be having dirty sex like you've never seen in your life. He's going to be in charge. He said it himself. He's going to be ruling. Who's he going to be ruling over? He's going to be ruling over you. And he's going to be demanding sex. Dirty stinky rotten staunchy sex any um you've got a thousand years of people reproducing and so the amount of people on the face of earth will grow rapidly uh remember yeah, he's gonna be just going at it like a rabbit rapidly it said that if someone dies at a hundred years of age it, it says that they would be as if they were accursed or cursed um so what he just throws out a verse that has absolutely no relevance to whatever point he might be making. And years of people reproducing, and so the amount of people on the face of Earth will grow rapidly. Uh, remember, it said that if someone dies at a hundred years of age, it, it, I remember that. It, it says that they would be as if they were accursed. Or, what the hell has that got to do with anything? Um, so there will just be multitudes of people and unfortunately you will see a great rebellion during this time during the thousand years when Jesus is reigning there's going to be a great rebellion does that even begin to make any sense to you a thousand years of rebellion I thought it was a thousand years of peace and joy and dirty sex so you can imagine that during the millennial reign as children are born the simple fact is that they have no idea what a fallen and broken world will look like no but you'll show you'll show them won't you you're ruling over them so it would be on you to teach them, wouldn't you? Wouldn't it? I mean, right there, he's saying that there will be unsaved people living during this period after Jesus returns. So everything's going to be fine. There's going to be no sin. <laughs> but there has to be people dying. If they're not saved. They have to die. But there can't be death. Otherwise there's no joy. <laughs> I mean... If there's people dying, then it can't be just joy. Now, this is the problem when you download your sermons off the internet. Your sermons don't make any sense. Can you imagine that, being born and seeing only the reign of Jesus Christ in your life? That's all they will know is... That, that doesn't even... There's no scripture to support that idea. None whatsoever. Being Jesus. They will live in a time that the world has not seen since the Garden of Eden. Uh, will it be completely back to that state? Probably not, but... He's just making stuff up right now. Just making stuff up. Very close. One day there'll be a new heaven and a new earth that will be totally... 
See, he's, um, he just made, he went off script when he said that. Notice that? Just making stuff up. That's all they will know is King Jesus. They will live in a time that the world has not seen since the Garden of Eden. See, he read that. Now he's going to go off script with his own thought. Uh, will it be completely back to that state? Probably not, but very close. One day there'll be a new heaven and a new earth that will be totally... Yeah, one day there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. When does that happen? You know, that's interesting because we read that in Revelation um, Revelation 21, right? And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, right? New Jerusalem. And Second Peter chapter 3, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, we're going to go back to that. All right. And here in Isaiah 65, and 66 for behold I create new heavens and a new earth the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind for as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me saith the Lord so shall your seed and your name remain so let's go examine these real quickly All right. Um, what was I looking for here? All right, right there. Okay, so here in sixty in Isaiah sixty-five, for behold, I create new heavens and new earth; the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I created Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and join my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more an infant of days, nor an old man that has not, has not filled his days. For the child shall die in hundred years old, but the sinner, being in a hundred years old, shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat of eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant and another eat, for as the days of a tree are the days of my people and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands they shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble for they are the seed of the blessed Lord and their offspring with them and it shall come to pass that before they call I will answer it and while they are yet speaking I will hear all right the wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock and dust shall be the serpents meet they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain saith the Lord and then of course in um, chapter 66 do I want to read all this thus saith the Lord the heaven is my throne the earth is my footstool where is the house that ye build unto me and where is the place of my rest so our Jerusalem is not on earth our thrones are not on earth they are in heaven and when Jesus comes we are lifted up in the air and the enemy is gathered at our feet now I want to <laughs> I want to read that for all those things has mine hand made and all those things have been saith the Lord but to this man will I look even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word he that kills an ox is as if he slew a man he that sacrifices a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck he that offers an oblation as if he offered swine's blood 
He that burns incense as if he blessed an idol. Yeah, they have chosen their ways and their soul delights in their abominations. I also will choose their delusions. I will bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before mine eyes, and chose that in which I delighted not. Now, this is obviously talking about the unsaved people. All right, and think about this. All that is in the world, okay? So remember this, what, what I just read here. I will also... I also will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them because when I called none did answer when I spake they did not hear but they did evil before mine eyes and chose that in which I delighted not so if we go to 1st John chapter 2 starting in verse 15 love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but is of the world and the world passes away and the lust thereof but he that doeth the will of God abides forever see the lust of this world or what sometimes I refer to as dirty sex it's going away this world is passing away this world is going to go away in the lust thereof and the world passes away in the lust thereof the world passes away and the lust thereof I mean this world's going away and the lust is going away I know that that probably hurts your feelings a little bit it destroys your dreams don't it I mean if you're imagining thousand years of dirty rotten stinky sex where you're in charge and you're ruling over people and you, they have to have sex at your command boy this hurts doesn't it This hurts. It's got to hurt. I mean, you're either hurting or you're mad right about now, aren't you? Because I'm here to tell you there is no dirty, rotten, stinky sex for a thousand years. Yeah, what was, what was I getting at? Okay, so if I... Uh, Oh, you know, there's so much I wanted, I wanted, I could talk about this. I'm afraid I'd go off for another 30 minutes if I did. Let's just, um, highlight, um, what I was talking about earlier. What, what was I talking about earlier? Let me tell you, how did I miss that? Let's scroll right by it. Right there, okay. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. Did I read that already? And it came to pass that from one new moon to the other, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Alright, so, uh, you know, when Jesus comes, it's the end of the world it's the end of the world isn't it so the world passes away when does the world pass away it, it passes away at the end of the world when is the end of the world well Jesus was asked what is the end of the world he was asked that it's the end of the world is when he comes in the clouds of heaven the last trump the great sound of a trumpet it's the end of the world and when it's the end of the world there is no more dirty sex right when it's the end of the world the world passes away it's the end of the world when it's the end of the world the world passes away same thing and so when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven then 
we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of, of an eye at the last trump and we shall be raised incorruptible we're going to put on our immortality right so we see here in Matthew 24 and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and first Corinthians at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound this is the same moment in time and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory all right so I I don't think I'm gonna get all the way here let's see where are we at here I touched on that ridiculous point and then he's got one uh, some he's gonna say something goofy here in about 30 seconds so let's listen be totally restored so you can imagine during the millennial reign there will be no need for hospitals there will be no need for fire departments no need for policemen there's going to be an explosion of popula uh, population, but you don't need hospitals uh, to deliver babies. You'll deliver your own babies, right? And there won't be any police, so you'll just have to do what I say, right? And when I say, hey, I'm going to get you pregnant, well, that's it. That's all there is to it. No police. There is no open rebellion against God. Satan is not around. There is no crime. There's no violence and there's no drugs. The weather will be much better and the crops will grow like crazy uh, because the earth will be restored. So the world during this time will be ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? A thousand years of dirty sex and there's no crime, no evil or nothing, just dirty sex. There is no open rebellion against God. Satan is not around. There is no crime. There's no violence and there's no drugs. The weather will be much better and the crops will grow like crazy. Now what if my neighbor has sex with my wife during this thousand years? I'm just going to be okay with it? If there's no police, so what can I do? Uh, because the earth will be restored. So the world during this time will be ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember that you and I will be reigning and judging with him. Uh, but Jesus, like I said, will rule with an iron scepter. And what he says goes. Uh, and there will be punishment for those that attempt to. Wait, there's going to be punishment? Need for policemen. There is. Probably not, but very close. One day there'll be a new heaven and a new earth that will be totally restored. So you can imagine during the millennial reign there will be no need for hospitals. There will be no need for fire departments. No need for policemen. There is no open rebellion against God. There's no open rebellion against God. Satan is not around. There is no crime. There's no violence and there's no drugs. The weather will be much better and the crops will grow like crazy uh, because the earth will be restored. So the world during this time will be ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember that you and I will be reigning and judging with him. Uh, but Jesus, like I said, will rule with an iron scepter and what he says goes. Uh, and there will be punishment for... And there will be punishment. Well, if there's no crime, then why would there be punishment? And for those that attempt to rebel. So when Satan is released, and the news travels that sudden... So when Satan... Uh, there will be punishment for those that attempt to rebel. I thought he said that there was there would be no rebellion. Did, didn't he say there'd be no open rebellion? Weather will be much better and the crops will grow like crazy uh, because the earth will be restored. 
So the world during this time will be ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember that you and I will be reigning and judging with him. Uh, but Jesus, like I said, will rule with an iron scepter. And what he says goes. Uh, and there will be punishment for those that attempt to rebel. Completely back to that state? Probably not, but very close. One day there will be a new heaven and a new earth that will be totally restored. So you can imagine during the millennial reign there will be no need for hospitals, there will be no need for fire departments, no need for policemen. There is no open rebellion against God. Satan is not around, during what he says goes. Uh, and there will be punishment for those that attempt to rebel. <clears throat> this is crazy, man. This is crazy. So when Satan is released... I mean, you saw that, right? He says, there will be no rebellion. And then there will be punishment for those that rebel. And the news travels that suddenly there's an alternative ruler to Jesus. Everyone on earth who has not received the Lord Jesus in their hearts will have one final decision yeah, so you get one more chance to be saved, and this is pure wickedness. In other words, you don't have to be saved now. You can just wait until this thousand years, and then you can believe. Wait till after Jesus returns, and then you can believe. Isn't that what he's saying? You don't have to believe right now. Just wait until he comes in the clouds of heaven. And then you'll die of a heart attack and it won't matter anyway. I mean, what are you teaching? It does not make any sense at all. So Jesus returns and then you'll get, this is it. This is your last chance to believe. You know, that's as wicked and cruel as anything that any man could teach. If you're not saved today, and Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven today, it's too late. You've waited too long. There is no more opportunity to be saved after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. Because he's going to destroy everything. He's going to destroy all wickedness. And then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. See, so you can't have death after Jesus returns. And because you can't have death, you can't have unsaved people after Jesus returns. This is insanity. Pure. To make. Insane. Will they follow Jesus or will they not? And sadly, the text indicates that a innumerable amount of people uh, will choose to go the way of Satan, even after seeing the great... All you have is saved people. You have people in their immortal bodies, in their incorruptible bodies. And yet, and there's no open rebellion... And there's no crime. There's crops, but there's no drugs. Well, I don't understand that, but nevertheless. Marijuana crops, but no drugs. Okay, whatever. Don't care about that. You got open rebellion, but then all these people that you can't even number are going to be unsaved. Great reign of Jesus. And so I think that that is an amazing thing to think about, that though humanity at this point is living through an almost perfect environment, the real problem is humanity itself. Boy, that... That, uh... If that's true, what about now? What about right now? Is that a problem? I mean, really. What's the purpose of Jesus coming? 
Why does he come? I mean, does anybody think about what if he if he comes today, why? Why would he come today? Now, when Jesus comes, uh, it states right here that except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Well, here, this is clearly the, describing for us that if God let things play out the way they are playing out, that there would come a point where there would be nobody saved. But for our sakes, those of us that are born of God, God will shorten those days. But why? Why would God then say, okay, let's, let's do it over again. But this time... Um, you're going to be in your glorified bodies and well, yeah, apparently you're going to be having sex with, with women in their glorified bodies you know like Dolly Parton on steroids or something I, you know I love Dolly Parton right And then we're going to be having babies. And we're just repeating the cycle. Except I guess this time we're going to be living hundreds of years. And just reproducing like jackrabbits. A thousand years of just reproduction madness. But this time it's only going to be the saved people. But then somehow it's going to turn out that the whole world's going to be full of unsaved people. I mean, do, does anybody put any thought into this? You see how stupid this is? I mean, it is stupid. I mean, stupid hardly even begins to describe it. Fire is never quenched, and the worm never dies. Uh, meaning that there is yeah. being a gnashing of teeth. Place two are there, but not be in that place. Uh, it, hell is a place of constant and forever torment, yeah. as your Lord is. But right before it. you, and you rejected it, uh, has got to be the most painful thing to go through for all of eternity. And know that it didn't have to be this way, but I chose to put myself Okay, as we come to this next section in the book of Revelation, we are looking at something that is called the Great White Throne Judgment. Uh, and this is a judgment that is only reserved for those who have refused to receive Jesus Christ in their lives. It is a judgment of works, and we'll see that twice in this section. Believers, so you and I who believe in Jesus Christ, if you're here and you've put your faith in him, there is a certain judgment that you and I go through as well, but it is much different. Uh, it does not result in condemnation. Uh, it results in gain of heavenly riches. Gonna... There you go. There it is. All right, so if you help the old lady cross the street, you're going to get bonus rewards for all eternity you're gonna have an advantage over me that doesn't walk an old lady across the street forever for all eternity you're gonna have advantage over me because you did more than I did think about that I mean this is evil to the core that's a, that's exactly what he's saying he's got advantage over all the people that he talks to 
for all eternity because he did more good works than they did well but it is much different uh, it does not result in condemnation uh, it results in gain of heavenly riches okay, I'm going to give you three scriptures about that 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 2nd Corinthians 5 10 it says for we must all right 2nd Corinthians 5 10 so we're gonna walk through this I was trying to wrap this up but I I got to I gotta walk you through this 2nd Corinthians 5 10 oh, let's do it this way 2nd Corinthians 5 all 10. appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad <laughs> So, I, I mean, come on. For we must all. So, it, it, to me, it just, wow. How do you miss that? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Um, that everyone may receiveth the thi things done in this body. I mean, well, I don't know what the problem is here, right? Um, oh, what is that verse that parallels this here? No, oh, that's not. That's not it. No, I don't think this is it either. Right there it is. John 5. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And then here in 2 Corinthians 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. And now, of course, this the judgment seat of Christ is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. And so that alone nullifies this idea of a thousand years after, and then Jesus returning a second time. Nonsense. All right, so this is very simple. All right, you believe in God, then you're when you're born of God, then God sees you as good. All right, the only way to be good is if you are born of the Spirit of God. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's the only way, is if Jesus covers your sin. And therefore the Lord will not impute sin upon you. It's the only way. And because God is in you, then you are good. Without God, you're not good. There is nothing that we can do without him that is good oh excuse me ah oh, man you know what I feel like I could do this all day honestly okay so abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except abide in the vine and no more can ye except ye abide in me We can't do anything without God. So without God, we are not good. But with God, we are good. All right, They that have done good, we're good not because of ourselves. We're good because He's good and He is in us. And we have been chosen by Him. That's the only way for us to be good. And we're not good because of ourselves. We are good because God is good. Alright. Same thing. 
in 2 Corinthians 5. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. Right? So, Jesus abides in us that are born of the Spirit of God. He is in us, and we are in him. All right? We are one with God. All right? That everyone may receive the things done in his body. Whether we're born of God, or if we're not born of God, according to that that he has done, whether it be good or bad. See, we're bad, but if we're born of God, then we're good. Pretty simple, really. The second one is Romans chapter 14, verse 10. Romans 14, 10 says, But why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So you and I will receive blessing and even honor uh, as we are found faithful in our service to the Lord. Uh, and only those things that are done from a pure heart will be rewarded. So if you helped the lady across the street, but in your heart the whole time you said, Man, I've got places to be and this is not what I want to do. Uh, what do you think the Lord is going to say about that work? He's uh, he's using my language. Across the street will be rewarded. So if you helped the lady across the street, but in your heart the whole time you said, Man, I've got places to be and this is not what I want to do. Uh, what do you think the Lord is going to say? <laughs> I can't even begin to yeah you did something good but in your heart you didn't want to do it it, it hardly makes any sense but really does anything this guy say make any sense at all hmm. so if you help an old lady across the street you do it because you want to do it Right? But this guy, he wants to create doubt in your mind that, well, I did it, but I didn't really want to. I wanted to do something else. But I have to do it. I don't, I don't understand that mentality at all. Um, the implication is, of course, that if you do help the old lady cross the street and you want to, then you're a good person. Isn't that the implication? And if you're a good person, then you're going to get saved. I mean, we're just rolling through these verses here. Uh, for example, uh, what was that verse? Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, right? I mean, he just pointed to that. Uh, so everyone that um, may receive the things done in his body according to how many old ladies he walked across the street. whether it be good or bad right so if you helped the old lady across the street and you wanted to then you're gonna be saved but if you didn't if you helped her and you didn't really want to do it and you wanted to be somewhere else then you're not saved right? but it's all about walking the old lady across the street right yeah why is this guy using my terminologies? And, and then, of course, not making any sense with it. Look, the bottom line is this guy is claiming that you know, if you how do I explain this? He's he's claiming that if you walk that you know if you do good stuff you're gonna get extra bonus rewards and I don't know if he's talking about bonus rewards in the thousand year period that's coming or bonus rewards in the life after that or whatever world dispensation that he's talking about now, who knows is he talking about the thousand years when he's gonna be ruling over women and children and, and reproducing like mad is that the bonus he's getting? Or is it after the 
end of the world, the second end of the world. Or maybe it's after the third end of the world. I don't know. He doesn't really clarify. But he's just making the point that, hey, I'm going to have bonus rewards over you for all eternity. Because I helped the old lady across the street and I wanted to help her. God saw my heart and saw that it was good and so he gave me a bonus reward over all of you forever and ever. I mean, isn't that what he's teaching? That's exactly what he's teaching. Bonus rewards. You're going to have extra rewards in heaven because of the good things you did in on this earth, in this world. Right? That's exactly... And he's not the only one. There's a lot of evil men out there. A lot of evil men and seducers. Deceiving and being deceived. What's it say here in Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 13? Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived evil men and seducers and this is a classic example and the th point that I want to make by doing this every single day is showing you it's not one person it's 99.9% .9 of all the preachers that stand behind the pulpit in front of a congregation they all teach this they all teach us that this idea that you can wait to be saved and that there's coming a bonus thousand years of un, un, you know, unrestricted sexual dirty sex, whatever. And woo wee! Gonna be a good time. Except, uh, that's not true. It's not happening. Your time to be saved is right now. Right now. If you wait another second, it might be too late. Because when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's the end of the world. And it's too late. It's like that Def Leppard song. Too late. Too late. Too late to be saved. Alright, so I'm not a singer. Just relax. Stop freaking out. Okay, so let's walk through this. Revelation 20 lines up with everything that we've read all throughout the Bible. It's just another picture being painted for us. And it's very simple. It's not rocket science. You don't need to go to four years of uh, Bible seminary to figure this stuff out. All you need to do is believe that these are the words of God. Because they are. The pure words of God. These don't come from men. These are not uh, coming from a translation of a foreign language. This comes from God directly. The Word of God transcends all languages for all time, forever and ever. Now, in Revelation 20, verse 1, it parallels what we read in Revelation 1, chapter 1. And I tell you that I got to say this because it's very important and it gets missed. I'm sure of it. People don't realize. They're not able to connect the dots. Here in Revelation 1, verse 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So the angel is giving John things which must shortly come to pass and then what do we read here in Revelation 20 and I saw an angel I John saw an angel the angel is showing John is he, he connect the dots man this is not rocket science it's pretty simple All right, there's no need to be confused it's straightforward pretty simple stuff and I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand and he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years 
Now, just from a simple logistical standpoint, uh, you know, common sense says, well, okay, Satan was bound uh, for a thousand years. Mean that has to mean that he was not bound before the thousand years. Just simple logic. It's not hard to figure out. Man. I mean, if you just use your brain, God gave you a brain, didn't he? Right? So if you use your brain, then you ought to know that Satan was not bound before this thousand years. Now, if you knew the Bible, right? What's the Bible say about studying to show thyself approved? Doesn't, am I making that up? Or did I read that somewhere? Yeah, right there it is. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Alright. Pretty simple. Alright. Pretty simple stuff. Alright. Nice and easy. Alright, so... Uh, uh oh where was I at alright so any laid hold okay so the dragon was bound for a thousand years right so before the dragon was bound he was not bound and if we know the Old Testament we know that there was one nation of God and outside of those of that nation were there other nations that were not of God and because they were not of God they were of Satan All right, pretty simple stuff alright now uh, so that means Satan was deceiving those nations outside of the kingdom of God outside of the nation of Israel pretty simple stuff man. I mean we, we got just everything all throughout the Bible that makes that crystal clear. You don't need to go to seminary school. You don't need experts and scholars to tell you. All you have to do is believe the Bible that you hold in your hands. Pretty straightforward, simple stuff. And he cast, so now the serpent is bound and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more Till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season so why is he being bound what's different what what happened when Jesus come I mean, what's different you notice that in the Old Testament there was one nation of God now here comes Jesus and he says the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof Right? In Matthew 21. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. We notice here now in 1 Peter chapter 2, where it says, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. He's talking about those of us that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, it went from one country of people with borders to now the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the kingdom of God is available to everybody. So now, because there are no more nations that are just deceived by God, there's no more one boundary of people that are the nation of God, right? Now, the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 10 it says, Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So now Satan is bound because the kingdom of God is available all throughout the world. Right? So, at the end of the thousand years then Satan is loosed well, why is he loosed how is he able to deceive the nations well we know by reading the Bible that when Jesus comes 
we are lifted up in the air right first the dead in Christ then those less which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord right when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven we are in a moment we are changed in the twinkling of an eye we put on incorruption we put on immortality when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven what happens we are lifted up right just as we read in Genesis 3 verse 15 when it says when the Lord says to the serpent I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel right this is the fulfillment of that prophecy when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven he's gonna stomp his foot on the head of the serpent All right, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory this is all throughout the Bible okay it's consistent all throughout the Bible it's just very simple very straightforward very easy to understand right when Jesus comes it's the end of the world all right so where are we at here so um, when Jesus comes we're lifted up in the air and our enemy is gathered at our feet you know we read about the harvest about the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13 right it's the end of the world right when the harvest is the end of the world and what happens at the harvest the tares are gathered in bundles and burned but the wheat are gathered into my barn that means we're lifted up in the air with the Lord right so in verse 9 when we read about the beloved city and the Saints that are in the beloved city this is in the air the beloved city is New Jerusalem All right, our our holy city our holy city is above it's not here on earth it's above Galatians 4 verse 26 but Jerusalem which is above is free and is the mother of us all see we're, we're lifted up into the air and our enemies gathered at our feet right just like what we read in Revelation 3 verse 9 when it says behold I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee see we're gonna be up in the air and our enemy is gonna be gathered at our feet this is all throughout the Bible in Psalm 110 the Lord said unto my Lord sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy foot stool see we're up in the air and our enemy is at our feet first Corinthians 15 for he must reign till he has made till he has put all enemies under his feet see we're up in the air our enemy is gathered at our feet just as it reads in Revelation 20 and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them this is when Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent destroying death forever just as we read in first uh, Corinthians 15 twice the last enemy that is destroyed is death right so when we are gathered up when we are changed into our glorified bodies then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory all right so death is swallowed up in victory right and the enemy is destroyed forever right and so in verse 10 it, it says the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake and fire into the lake of fire that the lake of fire and brimstone the what we just read about in Revelation 19 where the beast and the false prophet are right this is not a different event this is same event it's telling you this is the same thing we just read in Revelation 19 about 
the beast and the false prophet being thrown into the lake of fire. And here we're reading about the devil being thrown into the lake of fire. This is the same place, the same thing, same time frame, same moment in time. It's all happening at the end of the world. It's not a different. Just like when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, this is not a second return. This is not a third return. This is the same moment in time when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. Right? Just like what we read in Matthew 24, when it says, The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Right? Here in Revelation 20, verse 11, it says, Whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. This is the same moment in time. It's given a the same description it's worded differently but it's the same thing when the, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it it's Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven it's the same thing so also in verse 10 when the devil is cast into the lake of fire it's the same thing that we're reading in Revelation 19 when the beast and the false prophet it's not a different event it's not a thousand years later it's the same thing. All you have to do is connect the dots. Very simple stuff. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to see this stuff. Now in verse 4, Revelation 20 verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Talking about those of us that are born of God. Let's go to Revelation 3 real quick. And it says, uh, To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame. So, who is he? Uh, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. See, we have overcome the world. Right? We have overcome the world. And because we have, right now, we've overcome the world because we believe in Jesus. So right now, we sit on thrones right now. Right now, we don't sit on earthly thrones. We sit on heavenly thrones. Right? Our holy city is above. Right? It's not on earth. We are from above. We are not of this world. Right? Right? So in Revelation 1. Verse 6 says, Jesus has made us kings. We sit on thrones right now. We are kings and priests unto God and His Father. Just like what we read in Exodus 19, when God spoke to the children of Israel, they were a kingdom of priests. Right now, we are a uh, kingdom of priests. We are kings and priests unto God. We sit on heavenly thrones right now. And the judgment of God has already been given to us right now. We are saved, sealed, secured, sanctified forever. Right? And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Right? So we have eternal life right now. We that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The judgment of God has already been given to us, and that judgment is everlasting life. We sit on heavenly thrones, and the judgment of God has already been given to us. The judgment was given unto them. That, that judgment is eternal life. Right? And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Uh, this is going on right now. This has been happening for a long time. Now, this is nothing new. This is not something that's going to happen. This is happening right now. But the rest of the dead live not again 
until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. So at the end of the thousand years, it's the end of the world. So, this thousand year period has to be right now. It has to be. It cannot be any other time. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. Let's go back. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. That means after the end of the thousand years, the dead will live again. Pretty simple, straightforward stuff, man. You don't need to go to 10 years of Bible seminary college to know that. You don't need to call up your favorite expert and scholar. All you have to do is believe the words that are written in the Bible that you hold in your hand. Just believe those words. That's all you have to do in order to see it. The rest of the dead live not again. They can, so they at the end of the thousand years, they lived again. And it describes this as the first resurrection. Well, what's that mean? Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. Well, what's that mean? Well, Jesus tells us plainly. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection. The, he's the resurrection. Well, you didn't know that, huh? Well, what's so hard to figure out? Why is this hard to figure out? Well, it's difficult when you got so many people lying to you. I understand that. But Jesus straightway tells us he is the resurrection. So now you come along and you're going to say, no, he's not the resurrection? What, if he's not the first resurrection, is he the, is he the second resurrection? Are you the first resurrection and Jesus, he comes after you? I mean, just be honest. Is that what you believe? You believe you're the first resurrection and then Jesus died in vain? Is that what you believe? Just be honest if that's what you believe. But the scripture is clear. Jesus is the resurrection and we are partakers of his resurrection. Jesus is the first resurrection. We even read this in 1 Corinthians 15. You've got to be willingly ignorant, really. Oh, I didn't read that part. All right. No, 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 I didn't realize you didn't. Here in 1 Corinthians 15, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So now you want to say Jesus isn't the first resurrection? You know the scripture. And you still say Jesus isn't the first resurrection? And then you're just a liar. Okay, you know full well what the scripture says. But you're going to lie and say something else. To fit the Hollywood movie that you watched the other night on Netflix, isn't it? That's why. That's the only reason. You want to put your authority above God's authority because the scripture is clear Jesus is the first resurrection and we that are born of God are partakers of his resurrection on such the second death has no power he that believeth in me though he were dead yet shall he live the second death has no power over us that are born of God and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die the second death has no power over us right now that are born of God but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years let's go to first uh, revelation 1 he has made us kings and priests it's, uh, straight away Jesus says we are priest of God in first Peter ch uh, chapter 2 we are a royal priesthood in Exodus 19 verse 6 you are uh, you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests we are called to preach the gospel to every creature we are priests of God and of Christ right now if you're not then you're not saved it's as simple as that 
if you don't reign with Christ right now, you're not saved. Obviously, those of us that are born of God, we reign with Christ right now. We have Christ abiding in us, and He abides, and we abide in Him. So we reign with Him right now. It's a unique time period, right? Because it's before, or I'm sorry, it's 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 after Jesus has come in the flesh, and it's before His promised return. It's a unique time period. Right? When the thousand years are expired, which is the end of the world, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And he shall gather together his people, the unsaved. See, we're up in the air. right? We're up in the air and he's gathered at our feet. And fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. This is when Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying evil forever and ever. This is a fulfillment that we read about um, of, of a prophecy that we read about in Genesis 3. I mean, this, is, this whole thing is taught from Genesis to Revelation. It's all throughout the Bible, the same thing. And it's, it's really simple. Right, so when at the end of the world Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent destroying evil forever all right and we have everlasting life through Jesus Christ and this is so simple man it's so simple so easy to see so easy to understand but it's only made difficult because there are so many liars and deceivers and evil men and seducers in the world today. And let that be evidence that the end of this world is near. Because there are so many evil men and seducers. And it's only getting worse.